The matter of faith. There have been men, many of them, who claim to be a new messiah. And tonight we're going to meet three of them, including one in the faraway Philippines who has amassed a flock, he says, numbers in the millions. Poor people who give what little they have to the man they believe is the second coming of Jesus. Bill Weir journeyed there to meet him. Throughout the Bible, prophets, angels, and Jesus himself all promised that the Son of God would return to create heaven on earth. And throughout the ages, billions of Christians have wondered, when? But what if the second coming is here, now? There are a number of would-be messiahs who claim exactly that, and few are more physically convincing than a former Russian traffic cop named Sergei Torop. In the woods of rural Siberia, he is known as Vissarion, the teacher. And around 5,000 disciples live around him, growing their own food and feasting on his every word. Meanwhile, in London, David Shaler says he is the true Lord of Lords. But unlike Vissarion, no one believes him. That doesn't bother me because I was chosen by God. The former British intelligence agent says his body was filled with the spirit of Jesus in 2007, a conviction which intensifies on a visit to Jerusalem. We're in the Church Holy Sepulchre, and this behind me is supposed to be the tomb of Christ. Well, I'm Christ, I'm not in the tomb, I'm not dead yet. But with no support, he lives in a squatter's camp outside London. By agreement with Jesus, I don't ask for money off people. If you're the Messiah, you shouldn't be asking for money, you should have faith that God will look after you. Prove to me that you are a son of God! But that is not a sentiment shared by Pastor Apollo Quibiloy, the most successful of the world's self-labeled saviors. The official coming of the Son of God was in April 13, 2005. He was an obscure evangelist from the rural Philippines until 2005 when he announced that God had appointed him Christ on earth, his reward for a pure life. Sinful thoughts. Uh, anger, lust, any of those things, you don't experience those on a daily basis? As a human being? Yes. I have all, already overcome all of those. There is no apocalypse in Kibaloi's message, no rapture or final judgment. Instead, he preaches that he is the model of Christianity. And as more people follow his example, God will gradually turn the earth back into the Garden of Eden. Do you perform miracles? For me, the greatest miracle is the changing of that spirit within. But healing the sick, the manifestations oh, yes, of Jesus' yes. powers, you, you, you're able to we do have, that? We have, we have healing. You we are healing. Healing and miracles happening. Kibaloi's ministry has exploded. He claims to reach six million followers with his satellite TV network, numerous publications, private jet, and personal helicopter. All the better to avoid the bumpy road and impoverished villages that lead to the walled compound he calls the Kingdom of Jesus Christ. Here is his five-bedroom home, surrounded by manicured gardens of imported grass. So this is your Garden of Eden? This is what we call the Garden of Eden restored. <laughs> For us here, we see everything as a ministry. My talent is to preach. My talent is to be a leader. Not everyone can become a preacher, or have been given a talent like me to go and lead the six million people. Right. But Jesus, when he, when he walked the earth, according to the Bible, uh, lived among lepers and prostitutes. I live among, among them. You have a private jet. I live among them. Before I had the you, private you're jet. You're in a walled compound with mansions. We, before this, I lived among the, these people. Like, for example, that jet that you're talking about. Do you know that in 1983, I had the revelation of that jet? That the Lord is going to give me that? Yeah. It is Him who gave me that. If it is not His will, how can I afford that? Well... <laughs> Kibaloi has been accused of kidnapping and brainwashing by the parents of at least one of his followers, but he was never charged. He insists that anyone is free to leave his flock and seal their fate for eternity. Will they go to hell? It's up to them. They know that. So that's your will, you know. If you want to go to hell, no one will stop you. 
If you want to go to heaven and follow this way, no one will stop you to come work with you. Yeah. There are three possibilities here. You are so, either the son of God or you're delusional or you're a very successful con man. I respect your point of view, but I resent what you said that uh, your followers will say, I'm a con man with a speaking ability that I've tried to con people. That is not who I am. I'm not trying to con people. I am speaking the truth. Skepticism is a cross all modern messiahs must bear. In Siberia, Vissarion has also been accused of mind control, but there's not enough evidence to try him. And David Shaler? Well, there are fewer legal headaches for prophets without followers, but still plenty of moments to bring a so-called son of God back to earth. Do you think you're Jesus? Sorry? Are you Jesus? I am Jesus, yes. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm Bill Weir for Nightline in Davao, Philippines. Can we have some quiet? No shortage of skeptics, no shortage of believers. Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, and Iraq monopolize a lot of the headlines these days, but they're not the only groups at war. So how many wars are happening right now? Well, currently there are 10 active wars and eight active military conflicts worldwide. We're limiting the scope here to wars only. According to American University professor Joshua Goldstein, wars include any ongoing violent conflict between two or more parties where a thousand people or more have died within a year. In Syria, there are numerous groups fighting, including ISIS, Syrian rebels, and the Syrian government. The war started in 2011 as a movement to oust President Bashar al-Assad and his government. It's currently by far the bloodiest conflict on a day-by-day -day basis. According to some reports, Bashar al-Assad and his government are committing war crimes against their own people. In Afghanistan, the Afghan government is fighting the Taliban, but violence has slowed recently and international troops are starting to pull out. If everything goes well, there could be an end in sight for this conflict. In Pakistan, the government is fighting with the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and other terrorist groups in an autonomous tribal region bordering Afghanistan. This is where numerous terrorist groups have set up training facilities and hideouts. The Pakistani government has had some success, but the operation is far from over. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, there has been constant conflict since 1998, with everyone from Joseph Kony to the perpetrators of the genocide in Rwanda involved. The country is in turmoil, and there is no end in sight. South Sudan successfully seceded from Sudan in 2011, and since then, a civil war has broken out in South Sudan along ethnic lines, with the Dinkas fighting on behalf of the current president, and the Newers fighting on behalf of the former vice president. The area is also experiencing famine, which is making the entire situation much worse. In Libya, the Libyan government is facing factional violence stemming from the downfall of longtime dictator Muammar Gaddafi in 2011 and the civil war that followed. They do have an interim government in place, but little can be done to stop the fighting. In Ukraine, the Ukrainian government is currently fighting Russian-backed separatists for the eastern part of Ukraine. There are some reports that Russia is also directly involved in the fighting. The remaining three active wars are in Iraq, Israel, Palestine, and Nigeria. And China has admitted to deploying weapons on a contested island in the South China Sea as the U.S. calls for de-escalation in disputed waters. China's defense ministry confirmed sending arms to Woody Island in the Paracels chain. It appears China has put art weapons on its artificial islands the one it built in the disputed section of the South China Sea. That's according to Asia Maritime Transparency. I'm going to start with news that North Korea has fired at least four projectiles into the East Sea. We are awaiting confirmation on what kind of missiles they were, but what we do know is they flew for hundreds of kilometers before coming down in the ocean. Now, officials say the missiles flew around 1,000 kilometers before landing in the East Sea. 
Uh, Defense Minister officials said the missiles were likely Pukusong 2, an upgraded version of the Mustan, uh, which is an intermediate ballistic missile. However, Seoul and Washington are still trying to figure out the exact uh, type of missiles. Now, Japan has announced that three of the four missiles fell in this exclusive economic zone, uh, one within 250 kilometers of Japanese land. Russia says relations with the United States are at the lowest point since the Cold War. Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov says the ties deteriorated before the Ukrainian crisis under the administration of the former U.S. President Barack Obama. Ryabkov believes that Donald Trump's presidency began amid prevailing anti-Russia sentiments with opponents of Trump inflaming Russophobia to discredit him. The deputy added that his country would analyze signals and approaches stemming from an upcoming Trump address to Congress. He also said that Moscow has not asked Washington to lift sanctions against Russia. However, he noted that without sanctions, it would be easier to work with the U.S. on the Syrian crisis. The United Nations has officially declared a famine in South Sudan, the first to be declared anywhere in the world in the past six years. The UN is calling it a man-made catastrophe caused by war and economic collapse. More than 100,000 people in two countries did not have enough to eat, and there are fears that the famine will spread to an additional one million other South Sudanese who are already on the brink of starvation. The situation is catastrophic. We estimate nearly 1.4 million children in Nigeria, Somalia, Yemen, and South Sudan, where famine was just declared, to be severely malnourished and at imminent risk of death. Bolivia is under a state of emergency after a vast agricultural area of around 1,000 hectares was laid to ruin by a plague of locusts. The locusts first appeared about one week ago in an area near Santa Cruz. The government has released 655,000 euros in extra funding for fumigation. A powerful earthquake has struck in the country of Taiwan today, February 10th of 2017. 5.6 magnitude has hit not far from inland in the region of Tainan, Taiwan. Authorities in snowbound central Italy are appealing for help after four strong earthquakes hit the same region, battered by devastating and deadly tremors starting last August.
As you can see there on the screen, an earthquake with a magnitude of 7.2 has struck southwest of Fiji. The US Geological Survey says the epicenter was 284 kilometers off the coast of Fiji. Good morning, you're watching Weekend Updates on CNN Philippines. I'm Mai Rodriguez. A state of calamity has been declared in Surigao City after last night's magnitude 6.7 earthquake. Four are dead and at least 68 are injured. March the 5th, 2017. A powerful 5.9 magnitude earthquake strikes the Philippines. The quake caused many injuries and knocked out power for several hours in the city. Papua New Guinea hit by 6.5 earthquake. No tsunami expected. This just happened 20 minutes ago, guys. It's uh, March the 6th of 2017. A 4.3 magnitude earthquake has struck in the country of Switzerland. Very odd place for an earthquake to be struck. EMSC is reporting a 4.0 earthquake there in the Gulf of California, right along smack dab in the San Andreas Fault. USGS is not reporting it. A 5.5 magnitude earthquake hit a town in Turkey. Buildings were damaged and five or more people were injured. There were four more tremors after the strong earthquake. We a have. really strong shaker yeah, right now. Very big. You can tell we got that's a, a strong CBS jolt and it's still graph right now. This is a quite a jolt. Ginger, thank you. Coming up, more problems for a troubled earthquake. Center. Yep, we're, we're having, having an earthquake. earthquake. Okay, it, it appears to have stopped. Yep. Um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna jump right now to Look the to, yeah. To the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, let's get right on that right now. That felt very uh, close. Very strong. Yeah, let's get right on that. Okay. All right, um, Henry, we're going to bring you into this. You can see right now, I mean, we've got stuff kind of here falling. We've okay. got some, some uh, sort of ceiling. Now, while growing animosity for Orwellian governments is stirring up all around the globe, there's also an unseen war brewing against freedom of religion. Particularly Christians are being burned alive, beheaded, crucified, and tortured to death. Some are in prison, but most people aren't even aware of it. For the last century, Christians have made up an overwhelming global majority, comprising roughly one-third of the total population. In the Americas alone, some 86% identify as Christians. Yet, in a few parts of the world, Christians are severely persecuted for their beliefs. In fact, as much as 80% of all religious persecution overall is directed at Christians. So what are the worst countries to be a Christian? For the past 13 years in a row, the number one spot has been occupied by North Korea. Open Doors claims that between 50,000 and 70,000 Christians are currently interned in prisons and concentration camps there. Although North Korea claims freedom of religion, citizens are expected to exclusively worship their leaders, the Kim Dynasty. The U.S. State Department reports that the isolated country allows no religious freedom whatsoever. The second worst country to be a Christian is Somalia. The ongoing civil war combined with the anti-Christian Islamist group Al-Shabaab means that Christians have no governmental protections from violent attacks. Only about one in 8,000 Somalis are Christian compared to one in three worldwide. Similarly, parts of war-torn Iraq and Syria have been overtaken by the Islamic terrorist state, ISIS. As a result, Christians must convert to Islam, leave the country, or pay a religious minority tax, or risk being killed. Since the start of the Iraq War in 2003, the number of Iraqi Christians has fallen from about 1.5 million to an estimated 400,000. In Syria, some half a million Christians have been displaced in just the last few years alone. In Afghanistan, all citizens are considered to be Muslim by default, meaning that most laws end up disenfranchising Christians and other religious minorities. In fact, the only Christian church in Afghanistan is located within the Italian embassy. Additionally, a mass media law prevents any publications contrary to Islam, which inherently include any proselytizing or Christian literature. The few Christian converts who are discovered are often exiled to India with reports of beatings and sexual abuse while in custody. With North Korea a notable exception, nine out of the top ten worst countries for Christians are Muslim-majority nations in the Middle East and Africa. 
In recent years, Christians have all but abandoned those regions as violence and religious extremism continues to grow. Pope Francis has even referred to the persecution of Christians in the Middle East as a form of genocide. With the world split along religious divides and a growing Muslim population thought to rival Christianity by 2050, it seems as though Christianity has a diminishing chance of survival in certain parts of the world. A taxi driver was beheaded by Islamists in Egypt because he had a cross hanging in his windshield. The ancient churches in the Syrian city of Sadad were destroyed along with the lives of 45 Christians by U.S.-supported opposition military. At least 280 dead Christians in the Central African Republic after Muslim ex-rebels slaughtered them like chickens with machetes. 50 Christians burned to death in their pastor's home in Nigeria. According to the Christian charity Open Doors, in Eritrea, located in the Horn of Africa, the biggest party that's ever been had. They had my Jesus in the floor, and they were standing on his back, jumping up and down, laughing, jumping up and down, laughing, and he had become sin. Don't you think that God was pacing, wanting to put a stop to what was going on? All the hosts of hell were upon him. What is the difference between an Old Testament prophet and a New Testament prophet? New Testament prophet is more fun. What? The New Testament prophet is more fun. <laughs> he's, he's under grace. What? He's under. He's operating under the dispensation of grace. Okay. Okay. Not law. Okay. So he is not going to direct a people. What? He is not going to direct a people. Okay. He's not going to come in and say, "The Holy Spirit leads us today." Okay. He's not going to come in and say. The Holy Spirit leads us today. Israel never had the Holy Spirit like we have it today. Right. So we are led by the Holy Spirit. Okay. A prophet affirms today. He reveals things that you already have and you know in your heart. Mm -hmm. And as he does that, he, by the power of the ascension gift ministry that he has, releases what's inside of you. Okay. And usually all hell breaks loose straight after that. <laughs> and then once that you've overcome that little, you know, whatever it is that's coming against you, um, then you move to this next higher level. So I would say that he doesn't deal with the sin factor as much. What? He doesn't deal with the sin factor as much. What? He doesn't deal with the sin factor as much. <laughs> when we're happy. That's the thing that gives him the greatest joy this morning. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself because that's what makes God happy. Amen. And 
I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Report saying the, uh, the the Pope had said the Roman Catholic Church should seek forgiveness uh, from homosexuals. That, could you put that in context for us? Sure, Michael. This this again was part of that airborne press conference. Uh, recently, a very senior cardinal and a close advisor to Pope Francis uh, suggested that uh, that both the Church and the broader society have mistreated gays over the years, and he suggested that maybe it's time for the Church to make an apology. So the question to Pope Francis was, do you agree with that, uh, particularly in the context uh, of the tragedy of Orlando in the United States, the shootings at the Pulse nightclub? Uh, and the Pope's response was uh, that, uh, that he believes any time that Christians could have defended someone and failed to do it, uh, that they should make an apology. So that applies to gays, but he went on to say it's probably not just gays to whom we should be apologizing. We probably also should be apologizing to the poor, uh, to uh, women who have been exploited, uh, to children who have been taken advantage of through child labor, to you know people who have been victims of armed conflicts that the church has blessed over the years. Uh, so while he certainly was supportive of the idea of an apology, to, uh, to gays, he put that in a much broader context. Caught on video, a man walking into a local gas station and then punching the clerk several times, knocking him to the ground. Well, now the sheriff's department is asking for your help to identify this guy. The attack took place in this busy street in front of the Israeli police headquarters. The armed motorist opened fire on pedestrians, wounding at least two before speeding off towards the center of Jerusalem. August 2016 broke records in Mexico, but not for the right reasons. August saw more violent crime than any month before, with more than 16 reports of extortion, 200 kidnappings, and 1,500 assaults a day throughout the country. A 14-year-old teenager is in custody following a shooting at Townville Elementary in South Carolina on Wednesday. Two children and a teacher were shot in the attack. Now, Amnesty International's new report says thousands of asylum seekers, including unaccompanied children, are suffering violent abuse, illegal pushbacks and unlawful detention at the hands of the Hungarian government. Amnesty says it's simply a system designed to deter them. There's no question that public attitudes toward the lesbian, gay, and bisexual community have shifted dramatically in a relatively short amount of time. Just last year, the number of married same-sex couples in the U.S. has tripled. This disturbing footage was shot outside of CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, showing CERN scientists conducting what looks to be a satanic human sacrifice ritual. The ritual, which appears to be a mock human sacrifice, was conducted in front of a giant statue of the Hindu god Shiva. Rumors about what CERN actually is doing have been rampant since its creation. This Wall Street Journal article says that they are seeking the secrets of the universe or maybe opening the portals of hell. Yeah, well, sometimes they don't want to, and they're, you know, gaga, we can't get, you know, the, the frequency's weird, and, you know, it's sounding a little bit strange, and I'm like, if you don't get this right now, I swear to Lucifer, I'm gonna, you know, I get a little bit mad, and I'm like, if you don't get this right now, I swear to Lucifer, I'm gonna...
An artist's relation to solitude. An artist should stay for long periods of time looking at fast running rivers. Both of us are performance artists, and we both work with the public. In a way, offering the body for our public, that's the ultimate gesture. They are not just looking into the spectacle, they are part of the spectacle, and that's a big difference. It's not exactly the most encouraging news to kick off 2017. A University of Connecticut professor says a society could collapse in the 2020s due to increasing social unrest. Peter Turchin is an evolutionary anthropologist whose latest book is called Ages of Discord, a Structural Demographic Analysis of American History. He's a leader in the field of cliodynamics, which analyzes historical events like a science using predictions and models. And using a model that tracks a number of factors, he predicts that social instability and political violence will peak in the 2020s. One of those factors is elite overproduction, where society's elite population grows larger and more distant than the poor. But Turchin doesn't plan to stand and idly by. He told Newsbeat Social he and several colleagues want to develop a scientific understanding of how society got into this mess and then translate that science into policy to help us get out of it. Well, on behalf of humanity, we're rooting for you. Thank <laughs> you.